Columbia, I'm visualizing all your smiling faces out there. We're so honored that you're worshiping with us this morning, and I really hope you had a Merry Christmas, and I know you're ready to worship this morning. But before we do, if you're new to Columbia, would you let us know who you are? You can fill out a Connect card at columbiabaptist.org connect, and when you do, $25 will be donated to the Spend Yourself Food Pantry, helping those in need in your honor. Also, before we get started this morning, why don't you share this service with someone you know? You can hit the share button on Facebook or YouTube and post it so your friends can check out your church. And if you have kids, make sure you're checking out the Columbia Kids YouTube page because every week we post a video for preschoolers and grade schoolers and our team works so hard to get you the resources you can use to disciple your kids during this time. So make sure you check them out. And now it's time to head into worship. So make sure you get your fuzzy socks on, you know, get your space on the couch all selected. Make sure no one's in your way. Make sure the dog's comfortable, all the families together. We're gonna worship God together today. Good morning and welcome to Columbia. Please stand wherever you are and join us as we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I love singing that song. Even though Christmas is over, we're still celebrating that Jesus is alive. He's the risen Savior. So let's continue in worship. Uh, Elisa Lazard has prepared an awesome piece of art for us. So check this out as we continue to worship together this morning.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin came the world from a throne So God, we proclaim that you are our Lord, our King, our everything. We worship you. We honor you. We offer our praises, our songs. We offer our lives. And now, God, we move into a time of worship through giving of our finances. We offer just a portion of what you've blessed us with. And ask that, God, that you would use it for your glory and for your name. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people everywhere, they said, amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm about to share with you this morning uh, one of my favorite uh, Christmas carols. And uh, it's one of the videos we did a couple weeks ago in our very merry, unconventional Christmas special. 
It's called O Holy Night. So I pray that this blesses you this morning. Check it out.
everyone knows all about Christmas, right? You got Joseph, Mary, well, Mary riding on a donkey, showing up at the inn, and that old innkeeper saying, no room. So then they head to the stable. The stable that was full of animals. Lots of animals. I mean, a ton of animals. Then there's the shepherds tending their flocks by night. And three kings from Orient are bearing gifts they traveled so far. And finally, there is Jesus. <gasps> Away in a manger, the poor baby wakes. But no fear, because no crying he makes. All together on a silent night, on the 25th of December. But wait, is that really what happened? You see, not everything everyone knows is right. Manger mythology abounds. Let's study the Bible carefully to see what really happened on that first Christmas and reveal the manger myths. Oh man, I'm just going to miss Kristen Clifton saying no room. I'm just going to miss that. I hope that you did not miss the joy of Christmas and that you had a magnificent Christmas celebration. I hope you were with us on Christmas Eve, and I hope I'm the very first one to wish you a happy new year. I didn't expect to be preaching today, uh, but you know, plans change, and that's all right, and you'll get to hear from someone else next week, but it's just as well that I get to because I came really close to leaving out a really significant piece of the story. So before we jump into that, we've been having a lot of fun with Manger Myths, and I, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I just think it's been a fun way to jump into the story. But I'm going to tell you the primary point I want you to carry away from the Christmas season and from this Manger Myth series is that the details are not near as important as what God was actually doing in the incarnation. In fact, each of the gospel writers includes the detail he includes in order that you might see something significant about the theology of the incarnation. So when we get all caught up in all of the, the little things we love, the little details we tend to exacerbate and make up, when we get into the middle of those, we somehow tend to miss what's really going on here, which is just the beginning of the story. It is just the beginning of our understanding of what it means that God came to earth incarnate so that everyone who depends on him might be saved. Now that said, let's have just a little more fun and let's just bust a couple of more myths. A couple of these we've dealt with. There's one that I want to bring to the story today. So the first one is the one that seems to me has been most difficult for some people to give up and that's intriguing to me. And that is the notion, the idea that Joseph and Mary were just regular middle class people. A lot more like most of us than they were different from most of us. What made them exceptional was their faithfulness. And what makes us exceptional and useful in God's hands is always our faithfulness. That one is confirmed. We can say that that's true. Now let's turn to another one that I'll introduce today. And that is that the Magi were the first to celebrate the infant Jesus after the shepherds. Now I told you some family might have been around. I, I'm not taking for granted that there aren't others that were nearby, but I'm talking about those who were shared in the two gospel accounts that deal with any chronology at all of Jesus' birth, and that's Matthew and Luke. And so is it true that the Magi were the first to celebrate after the shepherds? So is it appropriate that we jump straight to that story? And here's what I want to tell you. That one is clearly busted. And I mean very clearly busted. And one of my questions is why we tend to jump to the Magi and skip a couple of people that I'm going to talk about today. A couple of people and one in particular who was waiting, waiting for something. And I'll bet some of you already know who I'll be talking about today. But let's just think about waiting for a moment if we could. So I've got some good news for you. You can start the wait. Uh, am I talking about waiting for a vaccine? Uh, no, I, I'm waiting for that, but that's not what I mean. Am I talking about waiting for regathering? Uh, man, I can't wait to be back together. But no, that's not what I'm talking about. Am I talking about being able to travel again or being able to go out to dinner normally or go to a movie or whatever you want to do? No, no, no. I'm talking about something really important, something you need to start waiting for. 
right now. So I'm going to be the first to tell you that from today, there are 363 days left till Christmas. Just 363 days. That's all you have to wait. Now, Christmas has always been a little bit about waiting, right? I love these couple of stories of children waiting for Christmas because I remember waiting for Christmas. I remember feeling like this little boy and you just couldn't wait for the day to get there and then all of a sudden it was there. Man, I I can remember how slow the days seemed to crawl. I guess it's true that as you get older, things go faster because it seems to me that the Christmas season's about half the, the length that it used to be. It used to seem like it was just so long, you'd be waiting for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and just the days would just crawl by. And now I snap my fingers and it seems to me the time is gone. But really what we create in Christmas and in Advent is something of a season, season of expectation. It's a season of very intentional waiting. And I want to present to you that waiting is a big part of our lives. That there are so many times in our lives that we are waiting for something to begin. You know, there's an old expression that says that life is what happens while you're waiting for life to begin. And I do think that there are many times that we're waiting for something to occur, something to change everything. And in that middle time of waiting, That's when everything that God really intends for us to appreciate and enjoy and and be grateful for is, is happening. There's a real sense, I think, in which we are constantly waiting for wonder rather than making every day wonderful. And and every day is wonderful because God is doing something in every day that we are alive, and he is preparing us for every day of our eternity. So every day, even the difficult ones, every day is wonderful, and yet we are constantly waiting for wonder. In fact, a lot of life is about some humdrum waiting, wouldn't you say? I mean, I can't tell you that every single day there's some wonder in my life. Every single uh, day there's something that just takes me by surprise. A whole lot of life is just common everyday faithfulness. It's just walking through the everyday commonness of life that really comprises a lot of who we are. And we're really going to see that in the story today. I have a favorite quote on this that uh, is by uh, Lewis Meads. Lewis Meads is a great Christian teacher. He says, waiting is the hardest work of hope. In fact, it isn't waiting in itself a form of hope? Because if we're waiting for something, it means we are exercising hope that God is going to accomplish something, going to do something, something's going to happen, or whatever. Well, let's jump into this story if we can, because I have something special I want to do at the end of this sermon, and and I want you to stick around with me, everybody in Columbia, because you're not going to want to miss what's a part of this, so I've got to move along in this one. And so let's just be reminded of a few things. First of all, the popular version of Christian is a literary composite. It's like a mosaic that we paint, and we pick up the bits and pieces from, from the fourfold gospel. We pick them up from, in this case, Matthew, Luke, and in some ways John and and John's theology, we get these little morsels, these little tidbits, and we we pull them in to build build a a whole meal. And if there's something missing, what we tend to do is to fill in the blanks. And we're good at that because God has given us magnificent imaginations, and I do think it's an incredible thing to imagine what happened on that first Christmas day. But sticking to what the authors tell us, just for a moment, if we could do that, not that there's any harm in imagining this mysterious day, but sticking to what the authors tells us is really important because they want us to see a few things about the incarnation and what it is, about this Jesus and who he is. So much that we assume is either untrue or at least unfounded. And the big question I want to ask today, and and I I suppose you can figure I'm already answering it, is, is anyone missing from the story? So, the story the way we know it. Once we have the baby Jesus, and once we have Mary, and once we have Joseph, and and once we have the shepherds enter the scene, we've got the angels, we have we have Elizabeth, and we have Zechariah, we've got John the Baptist, perhaps, if we've gone back far enough. Once we have all those characters, and once we've created this montage, and then a little later in, we, we bring the Magi, and the latter part of Matthew's story, is there anyone we've missed in between? 
And Luke tells us very clearly that there is. In fact, the story that Luke tells functions very much like the story of the Magi in Matthew. But it's a story we tend to overlook, even though it is much more overt, though its language is much clearer, and though it is much easier for us actually to see what Luke wants us to see than it is for us to see the the symbolism in the story of the Magi. Still, we tend to skip over, and I'll come back later to why I think that is, why we tend to do that in our imaginations, in our uh, understandings of the Christmas story. Now let's remember what Luke is trying to accomplish in his gospel, and I I can't reteach what I already taught, but you'll remember this. First of all, he wants to present the Christ to erudite Greco-Roman readers in the context of Roman history. And this is why he cares so much about the chronology of Roman history, about details of the birth itself, and especially about things that would make the story understandable to a very scientific mind. So the virgin birth, remember, is really important, explaining how this teenage girl could get pregnant if she weren't lying already with her husband, how that could happen. All of these things are things that Luke gives to the story because he wants his readers to understand who Jesus is. Remember, Jesus will become this great ethical teacher in the Gospel of Luke. He'll become this cultural reformer. He's no threat to the government at all. And in fact, the Roman government doesn't come off as a villain in this story. But very often, religious people do. Religious people who want to have a closed circle or a closed club and who have made religion all about earning the love of God or earning redemption in some way, they want to hold others out and they cannot see Jesus for who he really is. Now let's just get to one really significant thing about the Incarnation. God did not do this in the way that the Hebrew people expected he would. He was the Messiah who was prophesied, but he was not the the Messiah that the Jews tended to expect. They wanted a conqueror to come in, overthrow the Romans, reestablish David's monarchy, David's kingdom. They expected something different. And one of the questions we have to ask is, is, why did God act in ways that were different than the expectation of his own people? And one of the answers is they didn't understand what he was saying. That's, that one's kind of clear, but Another one is that God's vision for what he would accomplish in the incarnation was far greater than what most of the Jewish people could see. I'll show you in a few moments, not all of them, but what many of them could understand. He was sending his only son to redeem all of humanity, not just to redeem the Jews, not just to become the glory of the Jews, but also to make the Jewish people a light to the nations as he's promised he would. He had come, he was coming in the person of Jesus in order to save all of us who would call upon Christ, understand his cross as our opportunity of forgiveness, and see his empty tomb as an opportunity for recreation. So that's Luke's point in the incarnation. See here what God is doing. It's broad, it's big, it's vast, and he wants his Gentile readers to understand that, and he wants Jewish readers to understand, if they happen to pick up this gospel, that this really is what God was out to accomplish. So he writes, and I think this is intriguing. I tended to miss it until now, but in Luke 1, 2, he says, I decided to write an orderly account. And in some ways, I think he thinks that the other accounts that have been written are not ordered in such a way that that a mind used to reading history, used to reading chronology, used to reading science can understand. So he offers this gospel to the people who are being converted in the churches that Paul and his cohorts are planting. Luke has another agenda as well, and that is to present Jesus as this citizen reformer, this ethicist this philosopher. And so Luke tells these stories. There are five stories actually in Luke, and here they are. First of all, there's the story of Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist. Secondly, there's the angel announcement to Mary that she would become pregnant. And thirdly, there is the birth of Jesus. That's given in a little more detail than in Matthew. And fourthly, there's the visitation of the shepherds. And let's see, what else? Is there anything else in Luke's account? I mean, Matthew wasn't done after Jesus' birthday. He, he told this story to illustrate how the Jews rejected Jesus and, and how, how somehow the, these other persons, these magi, these Gentiles coming from the east somehow recognized him as the Messiah. 
Is there a story in Luke that functions in the same way? And the answer is yes. And that story is the temple presentation of Jesus. Jesus' presentation at the temple. Now I'm going to do this in a little bit of a reverse order today. And I'm actually just going to read the story and then walk back through it a little. And so let me just read this magnificent story and help you to understand this absolutely is, always has been recognized as a part of Luke's birth narrative of Jesus. It's, in fact, a really important part of the story, but we tend to exclude it from Christmas. We tend to separate it from the story of Christmas. So here it is in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 35. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. That's Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. This says saying, but it's actually singing. Praise God, singing. Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of the Gentiles, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, I'm not reading the whole story here because I'm leaving out a little shorter account of Anna, the prophetess. It is worth your consideration, it's worth your time, and and I would suggest that once I'm done today, you go and read it for yourself and, and see what is to be learned there. But it is the story of Simeon that is most important because it is into Simeon's mouth that Luke places the words he wants his readers to hear. He pulls this story that really happened, of Simeon at the temple, he pulls it forward in a way the other gospel writers don't because he wants his readers to hear and see something. Now again, I told you it functions in a way similar in some ways to the story Matthew uses of the Magi, but it is a, it is a very, very different account. It's a really different narrative. Now let's deal with the first part of the story before we jump into the story of Simeon. I should say it's easy to pay too much attention to the first part of the story to which Luke commits just three verses. And then he commits 14 verses to the story of Simeon and Anna. So what he really wants to tell us is is what Simeon is going to tell us. But he's got to get Jesus to the temple. And so he tells us about something that happens there. It's really intriguing because... Luke seems to, in this case, contract history a little to push it together. There are probably two times, actually, that Joseph and Mary went to the temple because that's what the law required. The first time would have been on the eighth day after Jesus' birth, and that's when Jesus would have been consecrated and circumcised. So you know of this tradition if you know anything about Jewish history, and and that's what apparently is the timing of this story. They go on the eighth day. But we are told that they are going there for the purification. And that's really intriguing Because it is Mary who by law needed to be purified at the temple before she could resume her normal life. If she gave birth to a male, she needed 40 days in order to wait and then go to the temple to be purified. In fact, the way Luke tells the story, he uses a plural pronoun that clearly refers both to Mary and to Jesus. So we're led to believe that both Jesus 
and Mary are being purified at the temple. And that's really intriguing because Jesus, the baby, would not have required purification. It was Mary who needed purification. Now, besides the fact that what Luke has probably done is to conflate two stories here, I think there is something that Luke wants us to see. I don't think he makes a mistake here. There is something he wants us to know about this Jesus, this Messiah who has been born. What is it? What is it? It is that the one who knew no sin and would never know sin in all his life, who could go to a cross and carry the world's sins upon his shoulders and pay a criminal's ransom for something he himself never did, someone who would never need purification, was carried to the temple and was included in a ceremony of purification. And what Luke wants you to know is this, that from the very beginning of his life, Jesus the Christ identifies with the sinfulness of humanity. See, this is the whole point of the incarnation. He is one of us. He is tempted in every way as we are, though he never sins. This is what the Word of God tells us. From the very beginning, Jesus takes our sin on him, identifies with our sin, understands what it is to live life in the flesh, in the body, just as I do just as you do. And Luke wants us to see this from the very, very beginning. But what we tend to do is instead of seeing that message, which is all important, we tend to see these little details and we tend, again, to fill in the blanks. Let me give you a little example. So this is where we tend to get the idea that Joseph and Mary were paupers. That and the Magnificat where Mary sings that she's of humble origin, which almost everyone in Palestine of her day was. Everyone was hand to mouth in that day. But we look at this story then and we see what happened. And what we see is that Mary offered two pigeons. And two pigeons was called the poverty sacrifice or the sacrifice of the poor. See, the law said clearly that if you were able, you should offer a lamb and a bird. Let's take a look at this. In Exodus chapter 13, 2, we see the story of the consecration. Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every room among the Israelites belong to me, whether human or animal. And then we turn our attention to Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Now listen carefully to the rest of the story. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred, Or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. She cannot go to the temple until that period. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from her bleeding. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, which became the temple, a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her. And then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Now, you see so much here when you look then at the story of Jesus' presentation of the temple. First of all, it's strange that Mary entered the temple courts with Jesus. Since she wasn't yet really allowed to do so, you ask, well, how did circumcision happen? It was the father's responsibility to have his son circumcised in this day and this time and in Hebrew history. But more than that... We are told that on that time, she is going to be purified, and yet she hasn't yet finished the time before she can be. And we're also told that she and Jesus are being purified, and that's not anywhere in the Old Testament. That's what Luke wants us to see. Jesus is identifying with our sin from the beginning. But then, of course, we see that she offers two pigeons. Now, a lot of people who are Bible scholars love to go back to this place in Leviticus and say, see there, 
See how poor she was? All she could afford was two pigeons. What they don't realize is that by this time, the culture had changed dramatically. When Leviticus was given to the Hebrew people, they were Bedouins, who, they were tribesmen, they were herds keepers. And so almost anyone with anything at all had access to at least a lamb or a few lambs. By the time Jesus comes along, we have a Roman stratified, specialized culture, much more like ours. Remember, Joseph was a tradesman. He was a stonemason, I think, or a carpenter. He was a tecton. And so, therefore, he did what everybody like him did. They went to the temple. They purchased the two pigeons at the temple. They made the sacrifice because in Jesus' day, and this was the whole problem, in this day, the law had become something of a shell game of satisfying the law in its letter, but not so much in its spirit. So how do I know that people used pigeons? And the answer is the Bible. Let's look forward instead of backward to Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. Remember that Jesus entered the temple courts? This is in Mark also, chapter 11. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling what? Birds, not lambs. Birds, because that's what everybody used by then. They went and they paid the money. Somebody made a buck. Somebody got wealthier. And the job, the deed was done. Again, it is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. So Joseph and Mary were just regular old middle class people. That's the way Matthew tells the story. That's the way Luke tells the story. What is exceptional in their stories is what God is doing. Not what human beings did, but what God is doing. Not even the details of the story, except those details that tell us exactly who Jesus is. Now let's look at this story of Simeon because it's the best part of the story. I love this picture of Simeon holding this baby. Despite the fact, I got to tell you that if I came to church with a newborn baby and some man I didn't know walked up to me and grabbed the baby and took the baby into his arms, I would be horrified, terrified, although that's exactly what happens to all preacher's kids. So anyway, that's that's kind of a scary deal, but somehow they knew that this Simeon was okay. Who is Simeon? He's another regular guy in the Gospel of Luke. You want to know why we skip this story? Because Simeon and Anna are too plain. There's nothing special about him. He's just a righteous man who's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's going into the temple courts because he's been waiting for something for a long time. And I want to tell you something intriguing about this story, and that is how comfortable Simeon is talking about his own death. It's something he's been considering for a long time. He knows he's redeemed. He knows he's going to see salvation. And he's ready to die as soon as one thing God has promised him has happened. And that is that he is able to see something, envision something. Have you ever waited for something like that? I don't want to be sappy, but every time I read this story, a man comes to my mind I was very close to in Lynchburg when I was a pastor. And this man was one of the most most righteous, dignified men I've ever known. He was one of the great senior saint leaders of that church. I just depended on him so much for what he thought. He and I had prayed for one thing every single time I met with him. In fact, we couldn't get on with business until we prayed for this one thing, and that was the salvation of his son. His son was unsaved. His son was far from God. It tore his heart up. He'd say, before we start, would you just pray with me for my son? We'd pray for the salvation of his son. One day I got a call from this precious man's wife, and she said, uh, you need to come. He's received terrible news. What he'd gotten was a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. The doctors told him it was very advanced, that he had probably weeks, maybe a month to live. And when I sat with him at his bedside, I said, man, I just got to tell you, you've lived such an awesome life, such an incredible life. And he said, look, I'm not afraid to die. I'm ready to go anytime, but there's one thing, there's one thing that will pain me if I die today, and that is that I have not seen my son saved. We prayed right there at his bedside again that his son would be saved. And I was so moved by this that I got out of that house and went home, and I I could not rest with this. And so I picked up the phone and called his son, who I knew, and I told him, do you know 
what your dad just prayed for? See, this guy hadn't even been able to go to see his dad yet. He was so torn up. He said, do you know what he just prayed for? He's not praying for himself. He's not praying for more time. He's not praying that he won't have pain. In fact, what he prayed was that he'd bring no shame to Jesus in his final days. He's praying for one thing, and that is for your salvation. He's praying for your salvation. There's a long silence, and then suddenly weeping. He said, man, can I just come over and we talk? And I, I went to this young man's house. Actually, he's about the age I am now. And we sat there, and we talked this through. And by the time I left, he'd prayed to receive Jesus. And it wasn't just a short thing either. He was baptized, and for the rest of the time I was in Lynchburg, he was an active part of that church and walked with Jesus. And once that had happened, my friend and mentor, he was ready to die. Death was no, was no enemy to him. As far as he was concerned, he could go to heaven because he knew that's where he was headed. And he, he was ready. He'd seen what he needed to see. And that's Simeon. Simeon waited for this. And what he was waiting for was Israel's consolation. Let's take a look again at the story. He was waiting, Luke says, for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. Very quickly, let me tell you about this word because it's really important in the Greek. The word for consolation or translated consolation in the NIV is periklesen. Periklesen is a word that means calling, summons, or encouragement. But here's the really interesting thing. It is a form of the same word that Jesus used when he told the apostles, I'm going to send you a comforter after I'm gone. Paraclete. Literally one who will be encouraged alongside you. One who will be called alongside you. The paraclete. In John chapter 14, 16 through 17, I'll ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another advocate, paraclete, comforter, to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Or in the Acts of the Apostles, which we often call the Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 1, verses 4 and th through 5. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised you, this paraclete, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you see what's happening here? I think Simeon is the first picture in Luke of the church of Jesus Christ. Holding the Savior in our arms and praying for the comfort of our people, praying for the presence of the Holy Spirit. The second part of Luke's book is the book of Acts, and it's the story of how the Holy Spirit led the church to be formed and founded, carrying Jesus in their arms, but this time the crucified and risen Lord also in their hearts. I think that what we're seeing here is Luke's picture of the Holy Spirit's work in the midst of all of this in ways we tend to miss. The consolation of Israel, but also this is what Simeon said. He said, now I can die. Now I can go home because I've seen your salvation. You're the light of the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Here's what Luke wants us to see. Here is a righteous Jew who knows that the mission of the Jews was to establish covenant with God that could be shared with the whole world. This little closed club that Judaism had become, this little closed club that some Christians tend to create, it is not of God, it is not biblical, and it is not of the Holy Spirit. We're either a light to others or we're not followers of Jesus. And what Simeon saw in Jesus was not just his own salvation. He knew he'd received that. Simeon's heart was for the salvation of the world, and he saw that the Jews would finally become the light for the nations. Sovereign Lord, I'm ready to be dismissed. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people Israel. And Isaiah had predicted this in chapters 42, 49, and 52, God says, I will keep with you a covenant. I'll make with you a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. That my salvation, right here in the prophecy of Isaiah, so tied to this story, 
may reach to the ends of the earth. Then later Isaiah will say, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Shouldn't the Jews have been able to see it? Well, sometimes we can't. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, because that's where the light of God shines, to the very ends of the earth. So what Luke wants us to see here, wants us to know, is that the only religion that is real is that which celebrates the salvation of God in the lives of everyone who receives Jesus as their Savior and Lord. That must be our heartbeat. It must be everything that we're about. Jesus is the Savior of all who wait for and receive him. That's confirmed. Jesus is the Savior of all who wait for and receive him, who receive his forgiveness and his offer of new life. And I celebrate that as a follower of Jesus as much as any person who hears the story for the very first time. But how about this one? Our response to Jesus reveals our heart's thoughts? Well, that's what Luke says, or rather that's what Simeon says on Luke, in Luke. He says this sign will come so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. I'm a little confused here, are you? Because I thought thoughts were in the head. I felt that feelings were in the heart. But what Simeon is saying is that the truth of who we really are will come out. We may express one thing with our mouths. We may even, feel, we may even think it. But at the end of the day, it is how we live our lives, how we invest our hearts in the world that matters to God. Do we have a heart for the salvation of humanity, like unto that of our Heavenly Father, who sent His one and only Son? That's confirmed. Our response to Jesus reveals our heart's thoughts. What will have to happen before you are ready to die? Now look, I, I'm not ready to go today. I would prefer to stick around and see a few more things, but if the Lord were to take me today, I would be happy because in my life I have seen him live and work and move in my children, in my family, in my church, in my community. I've seen his salvation. It's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of of his people Israel. Are you ready to go? If you had to go today, do you have the kind of relationship with God through Jesus Christ that would assure you of eternity, worshiping and praising him? Others have borne witness. One of the privileges I get to see are those saints who live holy, redeemed lives and go before us often older than I, they show us how to live and they show us how to die. Sometimes we need to recognize that an old man like Simeon can tell us what's most important because he's been around long enough to figure it out. I love this song that tells the story, so just listen to it as we close. I've seen your salvation 
vineyards and light of the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. five shackles the price to redeem her baby boy the baby softly cooing and nestled in her arms Simeon takes the boy and starts to sing and now that I've held him in my arms oh my life can come to an end and let your servants now depart in peace because I've seen your salvation he's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel time to take him in your arms. Your life will never come to an end. And he's the only way that you'll find peace. He'll give you salvation. He's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of his people, Israel. One of the things we weren't able to do this Christmas season that I missed so much was our service of remembrance, which Nancy Walker and I have worked on together for years. It just wasn't possible to do. But there are a lot of saints who have gone before us this year who have shown us how to live and have shown us how to die. And today we know are with our Heavenly Father. So before we walk away from this year, on the last Sunday of this year, would you just with me celebrate the lives of of these we have loved and have been loved by.
my life can come to an end. So let your servant now depart in peace. Yes, I've seen your salvation. He's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of his people, Israel. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that completes our lives. We will spend a lot of our lives waiting for moments of wonder, but every day in which you live, move, and have been is wonderful. We thank you, Lord, for these who have shown us as much, and we pray that as you have received them, so someday you will also receive us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now watch a few announcements before you go. Wow, that was so powerful. It's so meaningful to see those who have made such a difference in our church and in our lives and to remember them today. Now before you go, I have a couple of things to share with you. Every month we have what we call an adventure pack party for Columbia kids. This is a drive through event where kids pick up an adventure pack filled with fun and helpful tools that connect to what Columbia kids are talking about each month. Plus, there are always additional fun things at our adventure pack parties. The next adventure pack party is Saturday, January 9th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. You can register for your adventure pack at columbiabaptist.org slash kidsonline. And even if you don't have kids, please save that January 9th on your calendar too, because that will be our next food pantry drop-off. These food drop-offs over the past couple of months have been a huge deal in helping us keep the food pantry shelves stocked. The items we're looking for to stock up on can be found at columbiabaptist.org slash list. Thanks for being with us today. Again, if you're new to Columbia, please go to columbiabaptist.org slash connect and let us know who you are. We would love to get connected with you and send you a little welcome gift. Now, as Whole Life Disciples, embody the hope, peace, joy, and love of Christ this Christmas. Have a beautiful day, and we'll see you back next week. Again, I hope you have a magnificent beginning to the new year. I will see you in this year. We will be gathered together in this year. Think of that. I love you. I miss you. I'm praying for you. You go now and ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world. See you soon.